previously in the complete creation. Now, when I'm giving lectures, I routinely get a child to volunteer to play Cinderella and see if the foot fits. Obviously, it does, and remarkably so. Again, thank you for joining me in the next part of this saga. This exhaustive look at creation, evolution, science, philosophy, and the Bible. I've spent the past few lectures expounding on the profound evidence and implications of dinosaurs and humans living at the same time. I started off with the fossil human footprints found amongst the world-famous Paluxy River dinosaur trackways. I closed off the last lecture introducing this one fossil human footprint which was removed from the riverbed in the 1950s. Because this footprint was one in a trail of footprints and future researchers had no idea that someone had removed a track from the limestone ledge, the missing track led to a lot of confusion and misidentification of nearby depressions as fossil human footprints. Now, you remember those strange dinosaur tracks that appear to be from some web-footed dinosaur we saw on the Taylor Trail? I also showed you this example from the park ledge, but I didn't tell you where it was previously because you would not have known. <laughs> but here it is, right beside the hole left behind from where the Willet track was removed. So the next time you're at Creation Evidence Museum and you are looking at the Willet track with your own two eyeballs, look closely. There is a secondary track identical to those strange web-footed dinosaur tracks going sideways in the slab. The dinosaur evidently walked first, and then the human happened to step on top of the dinosaur track. It would appear this is why the ball portion of the foot is so deep. The mud was compressed by a track prior to the human stepping there. So the ball of the human's foot landed in the depression of the dinosaur track. So these strange dinosaur tracks are evidently pretty common in the Paluxy. But let's take a quick look at the trail of footprints. I'll call the Willet Trail. There's still three tracks in the trail that you can go and see today. So researchers would follow the left-right-left -left pattern expected in a trail of human footprints and conclude that somewhere in the area marked by the box, there should be a right footprint. It was originally here but it's been removed and no one knew this. However, immediately beside where the human footprint was, was one of these strange web-footed dinosaurs. And so historically, you'll see multiple people mark this dinosaur track as a human track because the dinosaur toe impressions aren't clear because of the apparent webbing between the toes. In fact, the entire track itself is pretty shallow but it is an actual fossil footprint with displaced mud. So I can see how someone could misinterpret this track as a human footprint, especially because it was in the vicinity of where you would expect to see the next step in a trail of fossil human footprints. Other people had marked this strange depression as the next footprint in the trail, and there may have actually been fossil footprints there. I don't know. I'm going by people's drawings from the 70s and 80s, but I can say that after decades of erosion, if there was some fossil footprints in that trough, then I could no longer see any details of fossil footprints. Going ahead of the Willet track, you can still see the next step in the trail, a left foot, which to this day still has pretty prominent impressions left behind of that all-important big toe and the second toe. 
You should go and play Cinderella and place your own foot in there to see just how good a fit it really is. This track is about five feet ahead of where the Willet track was. So now let's follow that approximate stride and five feet ahead of that left footprint is a vague but discernible right footprint. Once again, if you play Cinderella and place your foot in the footprint, you'll see how dramatically a vague footprint suddenly becomes a really nice one. One of the more important features of this particular track is the prominent displaced mud surrounding the footprint. This is called the expulsion rim, and it's simply caused by the foot of the person or animal stepping into the mud and the mud getting displaced around the perimeter of the foot. Of course, in this case, we're dealing with fossil footprints, so that mud turned to stone, thus preserving that expulsion rim. That expulsion rim is in, very important in distinguishing genuine fossil tracks from carvings, petroglyph petroglyphs, or fake tracks, and it will come up in surprising places very shortly. So now that we have the stride of the person making this trail of footprints, we can now be measure backwards from the Willet, and sure enough, right around the five foot radius, and in line with the other tracks, you can find a battered and beaten, yet discernible left footprint. Decades of erosion has certainly worked the track down to near oblivion, but bring a tape measure with you and look for that expulsion rim. The expulsion rim will mark out where to put your foot when you play Cinderella, and you'll see for yourself how, uh, for yourself how even today, the overall foot outline and even the toe impressions will fit your foot remarkably. In this particular track, the smaller toe impressions are the more prominent ones. Now, there is probably multiple tracks here, and here's why I say that. There's multiple prominent expulsion rims, more prominent than the you know, rippled surface of the rock. The oblique view really makes the, the expulsion rims stand out. The yellow outline track sure looks human, but has pushed mud up in front of the toes, which distorted the blue outline track, which we figure is the track associated with the Willet Trail. But this green outline track also pushed up a huge expulsion rim here that you can trace underneath the blue outline track where the expulsion rim has been flattened by the blue track. All of these tracks are distorting one another. Now, I digress, but I wanted to bring home the importance of the expulsion rim in both spotting and identifying fossil footprints. You may or may not get an expulsion rim with a footprint. It depends completely on how hard the mud is, how much pressure was applied. Uh, for example, if the person or animal jumped down hard onto the mud surface, etc. So the Willet track, although a truly spectacular track, has to be treated with extra caution for a few reasons. First, it's a loose track. That is, it is no longer in situ. Yes, we have the testimony of the person who removed the track, and we have the battered but in situ remains of the trail of footprints belonging to the Willett track, but Mr. Willett wasn't a paleontologist. He was just a local who decided he was going to take home this fossil footprint. There is no provenance for this track, no documentation of the track in situ, or exact measurements to say the tracks ahead and behind. The track could potentially be a carving. So how would you know? Enter the genius of Dr. Carl Baugh. He had multiple tracks for which he had no reason to conclude were carvings, but they were loose tracks, either excavated by people who didn't know to document or didn't care to document the tracks, or in other cases, tracks were found by prospectors. You remember those incredible flash floods I mentioned a few lectures ago? The flash floods will rip up rock ledges like they are nothing and both, ex both expose new tracks and trails or 
break up and rip up already exposed tracks and trails and thus depositing slabs of rock with tracks in them in random places in the riverbed. Prospectors come along flipping over rocks in the piles and finding mostly good old Texas rattlesnakes and copperheads, but occasionally finding fossil tracks like dinosaur tracks. They would take the slab home as a keepsake or look to sell it. Such was the case with the Delk track. In all cases, you have tracks which are in all likelihood not carvings or fakes, but they could be. Now, we researchers have our checklists of things we look for, our methods of spotting fakes, which have been refined over decades of research. I previously brought up Bernie Neufeld's paper in the Grizzly Journal from 1975. Now, while I had to point out Neufeld's egregious logical fallacy, and while I disagree with the overall conclusions of his paper, in no way do I wish to sweep under the rug the importance or relevance of what he did in that paper. He took several purported fossil footprints from the Paluxy River and he cut them in half. He did this so he could examine the laminations in the rock. Now what he did was smart. I'm not criticizing him for what he did. In fact, other creationists had already done the exact same thing. In fact, one of Newfeld's fellow Seventh-day Adventists, Clifford Burdick, wrote a response to Newfeld's paper basically saying, dude, we did this already. The results can be ambiguous. And Burdick is right. But Newfeld's paper still makes significant and interesting talking points about verifying or refuting the legitimacy of a track. This is a cast of what we now call the Caldwell track, named after Texas geologist Billy Caldwell, who made the mold of the track in about 1960. A local Glen Rose resident, also named Bill, <laughs> had been prospecting for tracks in the Paluxy when he found this one and removed a huge slab of rock from the riverbed. He had the slab in the back of his truck and showed it to Caldwell, offering it for purchase. Caldwell hemmed and hawed, and when Bill told Caldwell, he had someone offer him $600 for the track, Caldwell told him to sell the track while he could. <laughs> but he first asked to make a mold of this splendid track so he could show it to others. This is the only reason we even have casts of the Caldwell track. The track disappeared. Caldwell had no idea who bought the track or where it went afterwards until it showed up in Neufeld's paper. Neufeld had cut this very track apart, and here we are looking at the cross section of the track. Neufeld pointed to the fine laminations in the rock, and in particular, this lamination here, and he pointed out how it is truncated at the footprint indicating the footprint is a carving and not an actual fossil footprint because if the footprint was made while the rock was still soft mud, that lamination would have been bent downward as the mud was compressed by the foot. He argued that were it a legitimate fossil footprint, the laminations would conform to the depression of the footprint. As it turns out, this is only partly true. Now here you can see Professor M.E. Clark, looking at the cross-section of a fossil dinosaur track in situ in a ledge in the Paluxy River. So that depression right there is actually a dinosaur track. The ledge has been broken off, revealing the cross-section of the uh, rock through the dinosaur track. Now you can see the heel impression in the background, and here's the depression of the middle toe. Remember, it looks just like a giant chicken track. The laminations go all in the rock, they go all over the place. And in fact, here's a series of laminations conforming to each other, but anti-conforming to the dinosaur track. They actually bend in the opposite direction and an entire group of laminations are truncated by the dinosaur track. This is a genuine in situ dinosaur track. Obviously, non-conforming or even anti-conforming laminations in the rock 
do not indicate that a track is a carving. But let's go back to Newfeld's cross-section photo of the Caldwell track again for a second. This truncated lamination does not demonstrate the footprint as a carving, but it doesn't affirm it's a genuine fossil footprint either. However, look at this lamination. I would contend that that lamination is conforming to the compression contours of the foot, namely arcing upward parallel to the arch of the foot and downward at the sides of the foot where you would have the most compression because you have the expulsion adding pressure to the mud at the sides of the track. But let's take a quick look at two other tracks, both named after Clifford Burdick. The tracks were originally found in a storm were actually the tracks that led Roland T. Bird to head to the Paluxy River to excavate his now world famous dinosaur trail still on exhibit in the American Museum of Natural History. You can see that both the man track and the cat track have been sectioned multiple times. And yes, that is a big kitty. It probably stood, oh, about six feet tall or two meters at the shoulders. Nice kitty, meow. But gigantism in the fossil record is commonplace. So the giant size actually lines up with what we find elsewhere in the fossil record. Now let's take a look at the cross section of the Burdick Man Track, the kind courtesies of Dr. Don Patton on his excellent website that you need to visit. Here's the cut across the heel and the compression of the sediments is visible. This photograph was taken under black light and this is the big toe depression. You can see clear distortions in the rock conforming to the depressions. So we can conclude that the Burdick man track is a genuine fossil footprint. From all of these factors, we have learned several things. The presence of distorted laminations in the rock conforming to the track do demonstrate that the, rack is, the track is genuine. But the lack of distorted and conforming laminations does not demonstrate the track is a carving. As we saw with the in situ dinosaur track, even truncated and dramatically anti-conforming laminations can be seen in genuine fossil footprints. Now let's take a look at the Burdick cat track cross section. This particular cut right across the paw, clear as day, you can see conforming distortions of the internal structures of the rock distorted while the sediments were still soft mud stepped in by a really big kitty cat. Cat tracks found amongst dinosaur tracks is just as damning to the evolution myth as finding human footprints. However, all of this cutting of tracks is damaging to the fossils, literally removing material from the fossils. And then after that, sometimes you only get ambiguous results. So with necessity being the mother of innovation, Dr. Baugh had a bunch of loose slab fossils, which he had every reason to believe were genuine fossil tracks, but how to verify their authenticity without damaging the tracks? He was looking for non-destructive testing to be able to peer inside the rock somehow without cutting it. Some of you might already see where I'm going with this. There's several technologies now that allow you to do this, some of which you will undoubtedly already be familiar with, such as MRI, CT scanning, and X-rays. As it turns out, the more he thought about it, the more that X-rays made sense as they pinpointed exactly what he was looking for. Let me explain. This is a cast of some fossil footprints from Carboniferous rocks in Berea, Kentucky. These were the very tracks that led to that now infamous quote that if these were genuine human footprints, geologists would quit their jobs and take up truck driving. Professor Burroughs was studying the track site in the 1930s and brought in an artist 
to evaluate the dozens of alleged fossil footprints and give an opinion as to whether or not there were carvings. This artist did something unusual. He hauled out a magnifying glass and literally counted grains of sand both within the footprint and the surrounding host rock surface. He noted that within the footprint, it had compressed the sand grains closer together. Now, of course, this makes sense when you think about it, but there is a significant point to be discovered here. If the grains of sand are closer together, there is more grains of sand per cubic centimeter, which means the density of the rock is also higher. X-rays are invisible rays that pass through pretty much anything, but materials that are more dense block X-rays sooner than less dense materials. When you see an X-ray, you are looking at a negative image originally made on film. Uh, X-ray images or X-rays pass through your flesh with tremendous ease, but your bones block more X-rays. So the X-rays would expose the film, turning it black. If fewer X-rays make it to the film, the film stays clear. We backlight it, so more dense materials show up as white light, whereas less dense materials show up progressively blacker and blacker. So if we are looking to see density variations in rock caused by a footprint when it was made in still soft mud, X-rays are ideal and non-destructive. CT scans are three-dimensional x-rays. So Dr. Bach experimented with CT scanning technology first with the Glen Rose Medical Center, who were very kind in helping out. Now we've refined the process over the years and x-rays and CT scans have been used by many researchers over the years for fossils, but we're not aware of anybody else who has been using them to study fossil footprints. Let's take a look at the Delk track. This slab did not have any provenance. It was found loose in the riverbed by Alvis Delk many, many years ago, and we're pretty sure we know where it came from, but the location is sadly not available for excavation. So just like cutting the track with a saw and looking at the edge of the rock, we're going to do just that without ever cutting the rock. Even better yet, we're going to cut it into hundreds of slivers and look at each sliver. Let's start by cutting right here because I wish to show you something. When viewing CT scans, remember, whiter color is higher density, darker color is lower density, and we're looking for density variations in the rock and specifically density variations at the surface of the track itself. Here we are looking in from the end of the slab at the cross section where we cut it. Notice that on the upper surface, upper and lower surfaces, there's a thin veneer or higher density material. It's whiter than the rest. This is known to happen in concrete over time. A thin veneer of higher density rock crystallizes on the surface. We are seeing the exact same thing in limestone slabs. And that thin, higher density veneer becomes important because if the footprint is carved in that rock, then the carver will wind up cutting through that thin veneer. If it's a genuine footprint, then that thin veneer should conform to the track features. Allow me to demonstrate. Though there were a very few carvings of human footprints made to sell during the Depression, the carvers have admitted they did as much and even described the process. Taking some genuine Paluxy limestone, preferably with some contours already that closely resembled the track they intend to carve, and then working the rock with chisels, etc., and finally treating the surface with muriatic acid to wear down and hide the chisel marks. The amazing David Lyons and myself conducted this exact process to make a control rock for our CT scan research. Here you see David photographing our control rock after carving and applying muriatic acid. If we section across the rock in the CT scanner, you can see the high density veneer on the undulating rock sur surface of the rock and the veneer 
varies in thickness, but clear as day, you can see one of the depressions we cut into the rock. You wind up cutting through that high density veneer. I'm running out of time, so let me show you a single image from the dull track. We're going to cut through the track right here. So we're cutting right through the middle of that big toe impression and clipping the ball side of the foot, the ball and the side of the foot. And we'll look at the cross section from this direction. You can see the higher density veneer at the front and back of the big toe impression, uh, uh, as well as conforming to the depression of the foot, the veneer hasn't been removed from any carving. The lower density region immediately at the tip of the toe is for a couple of reasons. One, the toe was displacing mud ahead and behind, hence the reason for the higher density there. And two, removing the toe from that deep toe-shaped socket would cause some suction as the toe was pulled out. Thus, this would lead to lower density, and you will see this effect come up pretty often in studying these CT scans. All right, I'm out of time for this lecture. I hope you'll join me again in the next step in this journey. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. We had the perfect opportunity to test the CT scanning and confirm that it can indeed be used to discern a carved track. Looking at the side profile of the track, it is quite obvious that the hard surficial veneer is gone except for here, here, and here. The carver had to cut through that surficial veneer to cut the footprint. Now this verified what we already knew, that it was a carved track. This also verified that we could see the effects of carving using CT scanning technology. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's Video On Demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air, so please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.